I am here with Ingo Tietze and Karen Tietze Cox. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having us. So you have this uh, fantastic new book, Voices Free After SOVT. Since you're kind of considered uh, groundbreakers in this approach to the voice, what have we really learned in recent years through the, through the research that we didn't know before? Well, I'll, I'll begin and say that um, we haven't invented anything. We have just explained what has been going on for uh, centuries because uh, not only humans but animals also have learned to vocalize with their mouth nearly closed or in some cases like a frog completely closed. And so, and people have played kazoos and people have worked with, you know, cellophane uh, uh, over a comb and made sounds that way, all of them realizing that the voice gets better when the uh, acoustic energy is not all uh, emitted from the mouth, but it goes back and helps the sound source. And we've just put the science with it uh, in, in the recent years. Yeah. We and also, that, and, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it's, it's um, we also spent a lot of time as father and daughter in this kitchens talking about these concepts for years and to the to the point where our kids, my kids and our family members would go, oh, here they go again. We would just talk and talk about these concepts and loved and were passionate about it. And then we realized, well, we really need to write some of this down <laughs> in a book. And um, yeah, we're, we've been excited about not only this process of learning about the history and just respecting what so many people have done um, to further this work. The more we researched and the more we spoke about it, the more we realized that we need to give credit where credit is due um, throughout history of how this has been developed. And you definitely go into that in the book and even pointing out the, the stemple exercises, um, the accent method, where didn't really think of those as truly SOVT, but even um, M's and N's, where we'll use those in, in vocal exercises, mum, 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 nay, 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 that's a form of SOVT. Right. Yeah. And following up on what Karen said, about giving credit, I think what we, what she tried to do in the book more than in most books written is create the largest bibliography possible for people to read the original work. So they don't just read our book and say, well, you know, it belongs to us. But uh, she came up with over 300 references at the back um, where people can find out, you know, where it comes from. That's painstaking like work. Yeah, it's by no means like a, an exhaustive also a, a process because even as we sit here, I'm sure many more papers have been written on this subject and and it will be out of date by the time anyone reads it because <laughs> it's such a hot topic. So many people love these methods. Um, yeah. So Ingo, why is it so important that we get this, this, this back pressure or this, this conservation of energy that SOVT helps? Well, you know, if our mouth is open and we use lung pressure basically to uh, start an airflow and to begin the vocal folds into vibration, there will be a strong pressure underneath the vocal folds but there will be a weak pressure above the vocal folds and that tends to drive everything north, so to speak, and does not keep the vocal folds in the best position possible and the best configuration. And so by having that back pressure, as it's now called, behind the lips, that helps in the vocal folds to maintain a more stable and a more efficient uh, posture uh, for, for vibration. And we hope, and everybody hopes that by practicing that and then you open the mouth that some of that uh, better posture will remain uh, with the motor patterns that are developed and and with the sensory system that we have and so karen if, if is anybody really looking at at protocols like 
how long it takes the motor system to really uh, memorize or learn what we're getting from SOVTs? That's a really good question. I've been asked that many times. Can you please come up with a protocol for this? Um, but we've resisted that because we know that this is a very individual system that um, kind of self-organizes within each individual. And for some people, they do an SOVT, they use the straw once and it's like magic. It just changes everything for them and they don't need a, a whole lot of the process of learning that motor system. Others, it takes longer and it's more individualized. There are different nuances in, in that process of learning. Um, but we try to, as, as you see in the book, to find ways that, that gets our, our patients or our clients to a motor memory as quickly as possible using motor learning principles and um, learning principles that, that help train the voice. What I found, it, because lately with my own SOVT work, I like, if you can see my desk, I've got all different size straws, water bottles, all kinds of contraptions. Like I'm, I'm collecting these things like playing cards. But, <laughs> but I find that if I break up a variety, you know, because you, you, you point out something very important in it, where using a straw in water and, that, and the, the variations you can create by how deep you put that straw. And I find in my own voice, if I create more resistance and then back off the resistance and just feel those changes. And can I keep the same benefits as I lessen and lessen the resistance? Go to bigger straws. I've got the Mindy Pack straws in the cups and I'll use the, the one with the longer, thinner straw and then jump to the, to the bigger straw and back and forth. Are, are you finding that variations within SOVTs are important? Absolutely. Um, the, the concept is doing a lot of practice and doing variable practice. So that um, you, the nice thing about doing, uh, and we kind of talk about this in the book, is getting to high resistances, high resistance straws, um, but then as you use those as a target, it's almost like playing basketball. <laughs> if you, you know you need to get the ball in the hoop, and if you, if you get the ball in the hoop over and over and practice, have a a lot of practice but you're also shooting that ball all over the court and so you get a lot of variability but the target is very efficient it's getting it in the hoop so every time you use a, a high resistance straw you know that it's posturing the vocal folds to the best efficiency and then you also know that the vocal tract is also in a posture that is very optimal for vibration so if you have those that straw working for you that way you can do all the variability around that stable target. And for people who want to belt, um, going for higher closed quotients, right? We're, we're resisting more air, we're, um, to use lack of a better term, more muscle, if you will, more energy. Um, Ingo, how do, how do SOVTs help people who want to sing intense styles? Um. Well, the SOVT uh, is designed actually to take um, the adduction of the vocal folds to a sort of a mid-level, not too highly pressed and not too breathy. Um, but when we do certain sounds like belting and strong belting, then we do send it in a direction almost to a limit. In, uh, but then the beauty of the straw is it brings you back to the neutral position and for people that spend for example you know two hours uh, a night uh, singing Broadway with lots of belt uh, we would recommend that afterwards they go and do the SOVT exercises because that brings them back to sort of a mid registration um, and then the next next day they they can push it to the extreme again so it is a sort of a, a, a centralization of uh, voice production that you get with it so it's also an optimal, not just a warm up, but also a cool down. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. And then there's a chapter in the book where you talk about um, vocal tract narrowing. 
because the SOVTs would, right, it, it will make the, the vocal tract wider, but then for some of those more intense sounds, we, we want to have uh, constructive narrowings in the voice. So do you recommend, because for me, I feel like I can do SOVTs rather passively as a warm up, but then I can take a more intense singing posture through them as well. Is that, is that something you recommend? Yes, uh, you know, all of the variations in sound quality and in vowels and consonants that we get in voice production come from ratios uh, of areas in our airway, some being wide and some being narrow. As you know, when you do an E sound, you make the pharynx wider and you make the oral cavity more narrow. If you do an ah, you do the opposite. If you make an oo, you bring the tongue to a high position and you round the lips. And so you get all these variations of sound by producing uh, lots of different uh, uh, ratios of areas. And we believe that the SOVT is very helpful because it first widens the whole airway. And when you widen it, then you have better chance of selectively narrowing some portions and you get more flexibility in sound quality and in vowels and, and consonants. Yes, see, that's just, that's fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm having my, uh, my brain spinning now because I love that idea of going to that, that fully neutral place and then you can start to adjust and play. It's been interesting listening to different feedback that we have um, from presenting this material. Um, some folks have said, well, what, what is the active contraction? Um, and what's making, you know, the, that epilaryngeal tube or that larynx canal um, more narrow? And some of our, my answers have been, maybe it's not so much that there's active contraction, but there's passive stretching that allows for the pharynx to expand more and allows for more freedom to contract whatever muscles work for you. Um, so it's not just about what's actively contracting, but what is also relaxing and what is stretching and, and um, reposturing that's as, as important as what we actively contract. Yeah, I was just telling a student today, you know, we spend a lot of time working and coordinating at the vocal fold level, but as we progress in singing, a lot of our work is doing the same to the vocal tract. Yep. A, so this is an amazing help because for me, it, it stabilizes so much that now we can focus on doing things that we otherwise couldn't do because we're losing control because the energy is just flying out our mouth. Yeah. Well, and there's still quite a bit of belief among singing teachers and speech pathologists that there isn't much interaction. The source does what it does and the vocal tract does what it does. And it just filters what is produced at the source. But we have now recognized over a good number of decades that uh, strong interaction between the source and the filter or the vocal folds in the airway um, is what gives you all the variations in sound production that you're looking for. And just my experience as a voice teacher, when somebody gets into the right balance and they suddenly feel that ease of production, meanwhile, the voice just sounds huge with, with just all kinds yeah. of rich harmonics and, and ring, um, I, it has to be interacting. There's, I, I, you can hear it happen. You, you hear when it locks in and there it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you've created a chart in, in this book that I've, I've never seen before that for me was one of the more fascinating where you went every SOVT along a spectrum of from lowest resistance to highest resistance. Um, and the one that really I didn't think about but surprised me was the raspberry and how the raspberry actually has a rather high level of resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did it was was that pretty painstaking to go through and and work find the the levels of resistance for each one of those? It's the hardest one for people to do, and 
to keep a pressure transducer right behind the lips <laughs> to measure the pressure uh, and infer the lung pressure and get the ratio while all of this uh, tissue is vibrating and, and spit comes out the mouth and stuff. Um, yeah, it's one of the harder ones to, to measure. Oh, one thing that I think is really important that I've learned through, you know, doing this book is that there are so many, even if you just Google um, straw devices and, and pressure devices and things, there are more and more coming out. And what I um, learned to appreciate is that what's the most important thing is when you're looking at these devices is what is what is the resistance um, because that's going to tell you how to when to use that device and the nice thing about doing it in water is that you can you can measure that just by the column of water that it's inserted a straw is inserted in and that's going to tell you a lot about what that resistance is but there are other devices that are out there that we don't have sometimes the definition of the resistance so that's something that i i encourage um is to, for folks to actually measure that because it tells you a lot about where you want to go in in the process of um, advancing your client or or your patient and i also think i used to think of them as a warm-up or just something I could do when, when I'm not singing. But now I find making them an active part of working out my voice and even song work. I mean, for me, I, ha I have my devices at the ready and when something doesn't feel quite right, it's to the straw, it's play with the resistance, reduce the resistance, now try singing it again. Um, do you find more and more people are, are using them throughout their practice and not just warm ups? Yeah, I, th I think there's, I mean, as you can see in the book, there are so many things that even in the context of speech is an SOVT. So they're playing around with re resistances all the time in their vocalizations and their exercises. It's just understanding what that resistance is and then moving to what you want your goal to be. Uh, yeah. Very so, good. Oh, one thing I want to kind of bring up too, and this, this might seem a little controversial, <laughs> but um, one of the phrases that we have in the book is don't resist resistance. So many um, people, when they do an SLVT, they say, oh, that sounds, that feels different. That's not what I'm used to. And that's my answer to that. Well, that's the point. If it felt the same, we wouldn't be making a change. We wouldn't be reposturing anything. Um, so allowing the tissue to stretch and move and reposture is very important. And sometimes as singers, because we've been you know, working on our technique for years, we don't want to change that feeling. Um, but sometimes that's as, as important as learning the, the technique allowing it to change and not resist that that resistance no that's that's a fantastic point I, I i find if i can get into the right place with sovts it's it's a great moment to do some some body mapping and to just what what am i experiencing it where am i experiencing what is that that ease of production feel like to me because um there's amazing things going on perhaps ingo you could uh, just talk about at the vocal fold level um, where we're getting things like like uh, maximum flow declination rate and and certain things in vocal fold function why SOVT uh, allows that to happen and why it's so important uh, yeah well that connects again to what a uh, little bit we talked about earlier is uh, there definitely is a preferred uh, configuration of the vocal folds. For example, if the surfaces between left and right vocal folds are very parallel to each other, um, top to bottom, uh, then we get the easiest way to get phonation going. We call it the phonation threshold pressure is the lowest. And that's been shown with many models, with computation and, and whatever. Um, and so what we try to do is get that configuration with all these 
pressures that we get from the semi-occlusion to, to reach that ideal con configuration of the vocal folds. And, and it's been shown that SOVT gives you that. And the beauty of it is you don't have to have much thinking about it. It just gives it to you automatically. And, uh, and, and we get pushback for that because a lot of people say, well, everything you do with your voice involves cognition. You have to think about it in order to get it to go. And the beauty of SOVT is you don't have to think about anything. You just do it and the system goes into a better configuration. You can be doing while you're driving the car or walking on the street or doing dishes or wherever or, or, or getting on your treadmill and doing your other exercises. That just doing it will give you, um, you know, that better configuration. And that's beautiful to find something like that where your brain doesn't have to be constantly absorbed with it. Which allows you also to move towards really thinking about emoting. Like when you're in a, in a song or a vocalization and you don't want to be thinking about every little thing you're doing. You want to be thinking about the message and about what you're, you want the audience to feel. And the, an SOVT allows you to do that. Even in the context of speech, it, there are SOVTs that allow you to bring, come, back, come back to that nice, easy configuration that you learn by using straws or these other methods, lip trills and things. And what was really exciting to us is to bring in uh, infant vocalization into this. You know, uh, in the first two years while children uh, acquire speech, um, the, the brain, uh, you know, the, at least the motor cortex for speech production is not involved very much. It's basically doing uh, primal vocalizations. But what do they do? They do M's and N's and they lip, do lip trills and they do raspberries <laughs> and, and they do gargling kind of exercise. All of these are basically semi-occlusions where you get maximum power transfer between the glottis and uh, what you're saying to the listener. And so, in a sense, the semi-occlusion is already built uh, into our genetics, if you want to think of it that way. And into normal human development, going back to what is, is a normal development pattern, yeah. which is exactly how we want to learn. Reminds me when my son told me, you just have people make baby sounds for a living. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so that has a nice way to put it. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to let him know. Um, so, for those who are experiencing uh, vocal decline, right? So, let's say age-related uh, weakness or even bowing at the folds, how can SOVTs help them? Well, for bowing, uh, I think there's a very simple answer. It's it's the stretching of the vocal folds that's important because when you have a bowed vocal fold then the ligament is in that bowed configuration and you need to uh, stretch 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 to get it uh, more linear um, from one end to the other and you do that with uh, using high pitches and the beauty is that you can do very very high pitches gliding up and down uh, with a semi-occlusion without hurting yourself by excessive collisions if you get up in the morning and you were to you know, do high A's and C's or whatever uh, with a mouth open, you would probably do more damage than you would do a repair. But if you do it with the semi-occlusion, you can glide up there as many times as you want and it'll stretch that ligament. It's also been shown in a lot of the literature that SOVTs are great for unpressing, for hyperadducting the vocal folds, but just as important the SOVTs bring the membranous portions of the vocal folds together um, in, a, in a, a more efficient configuration, as we talked about before. So a more squared configuration, which also um, improves the closed quotient, so you don't have a lot of air escaping, which happens with a bowed vocal fold. And so you, you actually get efficiency on both sides of that, that spectrum, from hyper-adducted vocal folds um, to hypoadducted vocal folds where they're not coming together and it teaches them how to come together more efficiently. And if someone, this was a question asked for me today uh, by a student who had been invited to sing at some event and it was a three hour event. She was in the audience, wasn't brought up until the very last, had nothing to drink, 
voice was obviously couldn't warm up. And I said to her, as you're walking to the stage, if you can just do like a little Y buzz or something through very narrow lips, just it just, I mean, that can be effective in within just seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's another beauty of, of the, uh, the thin straw exercise. Um, it does not produce a lot of sound that other people hear. When I get on an airplane, I always take a straw with me and I can do my straw exercises and the buzz that I make is almost identical to the buzz that comes from the engines of the airplane and I never see a head turn towards me when I'm doing it. They don't pay attention, they're okay. But if I were to do normal voice exercises, the whole, the whole plane would know. So yeah, it, there may be, there may be officials meeting you at the gate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, when we go walking through the hills, my, my wife after a while is like, I'm just the whole time. She's like, so you got to stop. So maybe I'll bring my very thin straw next time. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you both so much um, for for joining us and um, answering these questions. So the book, again, is Voices Free After SOVT. Where can people get the book? Yep, this is the book. Um, I don't even know if that yep. is it. Uh, a little yep. higher. Yep. Okay, okay, there you go. <laughs> it is located, you can buy it on the NCBS website if you just go to ncbs.org. And there's a section at the bottom um, right on that front page that has a link to how to buy the book and what to click on. Perfect. And also when you go to NCVS, uh, I always send people there um, to check their medications uh, and, and its effect on the voice. It's just, it's a wonderful resource. So again, thank you both so much. You're welcome. Most welcome. Yep.